Hey YouTube, this is Noah with Sparksite. We're here to make video easy. It's been about a year since we first published our video on making a computer for editing in Premiere and After Effects. And since quite a lot has changed in that time, we wanted to make a bit of an update video. So then what are the most important things to know now that it is fall of 2020 when building or buying a computer for Premiere and After Effects? Well, it's still very much the case that if you want to get the most bang for your buck, then building your own custom computer is definitely the way to go. Now, we realize that this isn't for everyone. For some people, the prospect of potentially having to troubleshoot their own computer instead of being able to send it in for a warranty or something, it can be kind of concerning. If you're hesitant to put a whole system together yourself, there are a number of great system builders out there. Uh, the big one that we like to refer people to a lot is Puget Systems. They're going to charge a bit of a premium over building the system yourself, but you're still going to get an overall much better deal than if you were to buy something like a Dell Workstation or a Mac Pro. I must stress that despite how much we refer to them, Puget Systems is not a sponsor. They're just a powerhouse in the field of great resources online for benchmarking and performance for these programs that we use all the time. In the maelstrom of articles online about how good these different processors and graphics cards are for playing video games, Puget's one of the best places to go to to find out, hey, how is this actually gonna perform in my actual work? It is still absolutely true that there is no one-size-fits-all computer. What matters most of all is how good the parts that you select will perform in the programs that you actually use. At Sparksite, we mostly use Adobe Premiere Pro and After Effects, so that's why we focus on them. So some of the stuff that we mentioned in last year's video has not changed. Pretty much everything we said about uh, RAM, RAM speeds, and the amount of RAM you want to have, and storage, and the way you should set up your storage situation, that's all pretty much the same. So if you're interested in any of that kind of stuff and you haven't watched the old video, definitely go back and do that. The stuff that has changed is mostly related to our recommendation for the CPU or the central processing unit. At the time that we recorded that video, AMD, which is Intel's main competitor, had just come out with a new line of powerful and interesting processors, but they were mostly out of stock when we were actually filming the video, and so it was hard to get our hands on them. Now, a year on, it's clear that AMD is not playing around. Whereas the conventional wisdom was that if you wanted to save some money and were on a budget, you get AMD, but if you wanted the best of the best, you get Intel, that's not really true anymore. The current line of AMD processors are called Ryzen 3rd generation, and its main representatives relevant to our discussion are the Ryzen 7 3800X, which has 8 cores for $400, the Ryzen 9 3900X, which has 12 cores for $500, and the Ryzen 9 3950X, which has 16 cores for $750. All of these processors are great, though it's those last two, the 3900X and the 3950X, that you're going to see a lot of in modern workstations. AMD also has a few high-end processors with lots of cores that they dramatically call Threadripper. These are much more expensive, but the current lineup includes the Ryzen 3960X with 24 cores for $1,400, the 3970X with 32 cores for $2,000, and the 3990X which has 64 cores for $4,000. In specific situations, these processors are very useful and can destroy the performance of their much cheaper, much lower core count counterparts. In contrast, the current line of 10th generation Intel chips we will look at include the Core i7-10700K, which is eight cores for $400, and the Core i9-10900K, which is 10 cores for $500. Intel also has a few high-end processors in the vein of Threadripper that they call X-Series, which include the 10940X, which is 14 cores for $800, and the 10980XE, which has 18 cores for $1,000. Now, it's important to reiterate that core count is not everything. Some programs can benefit greatly from having a huge number of cores to chew up and use for their processes, but Premiere and After Effects are not those programs. What can matter much more is the speed and efficiency of the individual cores in the processor, which is a lot harder to quantify. Puget has an awesome automated benchmarking tool that it uses to figure out the actual real-world performance of these applications. In Premiere and After Effects, it does things like measure the live playback speed and how snappy the timeline is and how long exports take. It's then able to use this information to construct a kind of average score, an overall metric of how snappy and fast that processor actually is in that application. So to make the value proposition of these different processors more clear, I took Puget's benchmark score and then plotted it against how much these processors typically cost. I mean, sometimes you'll find them for more or less expensive than this, but this is kind of like the average price of each processor. So first we're gonna take a look at Adobe Premiere Pro specifically. 
And you might notice that there's a nice steady curve where as the price of the processors go up and the number of cores increases, the performance rises. The Threadripper 3970X is the clear winner in terms of overall performance, especially in export times where it dominates. The 3960X isn't far behind though, and I elected not to include the 64-core 3990X because it actually is slightly below the 3970X and is twice as much. Even if you can afford it, it doesn't make sense to get that processor for Premiere or After Effects. On top of that though, for legitimately half as much as the 3970X, you could get the 3950X or the 10980XE, which are not that much worse from a performance perspective. The big advantage that these high core count processors have, and the thing that actually pushes them up higher on the chart, is their export time score, how quickly they're able to render final products. But in terms of live playback performance, they're actually much closer together. So if you want to save a little bit of money, it actually makes the most sense to pick the 3950X or the 10980XE. Though, obviously, between the two of those, I'd go with the 3950X. I mean, it performs roughly exactly the same for another $250 less. Puget also regularly recommends the i9-10900K or the 3900X from AMD as fantastic options for those on a bit tighter of a budget. For the systems they build for people regularly editing 4K footage, those are exactly the processors that they use. Overall, you'll notice that at each price tier, uh, it's a close race between a processor from each company. They just kind of trade places. AMD processors are slightly faster in terms of live playback in some situations, but this isn't even always noticeable. At each price point, you can't really go wrong by selecting either Intel or the AMD variant. With such close results, it might just come down to preference. Now, Puget tends to recommend Intel processors over AMD because the platform that they're on, the motherboard that they used, tend to much more reliably support Thunderbolt external devices, like external hard drives and stuff, which for some people is really helpful. But if that's not a huge issue for you, then these AMD processors are looking very spicy. Now, let's turn to After Effects, where things are gonna get really interesting. When we plot all of these processors out on the After Effects chart, suddenly things have flattened out. This is because After Effects takes very little advantage of processors that have more cores, and so the previously huge lead that the Threadripper processors had is now gone. What After Effects loves is a smaller number of cores which run really fast. The best value processor for After Effects is, in our opinion, the i9-10900K, followed quickly by, well, basically everything else. The 10700K, the 3900X, and the 3950X are all going to hover around the same level of performance. Puget does point out that Intel processors have a slight lead in RAM preview speed, so how long it takes to render a preview when you're working in After Effects. This is why Puget usually recommends the 10900K for systems focusing primarily on After Effects. So with all of this information, what is the best processor for someone who's working both in Premiere and After Effects like we do at SparkSight all the time? Well, if you just have money to burn and want the best of the best, then the Threadripper 3970X is the clear winner. It's near the top of both charts and will serve you very well. However, if you're on any kind of a budget, it makes way more sense to save that money and spend it on something that will actually increase your performance by a proportional amount, like in getting more RAM or better storage. In that case, I'd strongly recommend something in the range of the i9-10900K or the 3900X. They perform consistently well in After Effects and Premiere and are a much better value. For a bit more, you could get the 3950X, which will give you a noticeable boost in Premiere, but leave After Effects mostly the same. Comparing all of these processors to the last generation, it's honestly, at least on the Intel side, very incremental improvements. AMD has made some huge leaps, and now they're pretty much tied neck and neck with Intel in a lot of different ways, so it's just a great time with lots of competition and I'm really excited about what's going to happen next. But if your current system is just one generation behind all the stuff that I just mentioned, it's probably not really worthwhile upgrading at the current time. One quick thing I want to mention here is that both AMD and Intel have launched some refreshed variations of some of the processors that I just went over. For AMD, these are noted by the T at the end of the processor name. So instead of the 3900X, you would have the 3900XT. And Puget has shown that in terms of the programs we're talking about, it's a negligible like 3% performance difference. So we would recommend just getting whatever one is cheaper or easier to get your hands on. For Intel, they recently launched the i9-10850K, which was just a slightly cut down version of the 10900K, but same situation, the performance difference is negligible in Premiere and After Effects. Lastly, I just want to take a moment to talk about graphics cards. When we made our last video, GPU acceleration in Premiere and After Effects was 
uh, it left some things to be desired. Now it's clear that Adobe is working to add a lot more GPU optimization into all of its different programs. And one of the main ways that worked out earlier this year was the addition of H.264 hardware encoding, which is just a fancy way of saying it can use your GPU now to dramatically accelerate the exporting of the most commonly used web video format. In some cases, this can reduce export times by an absurd amount, leading to two, three, four, or even five times faster rendering speeds. It's pretty incredible. However, there are still some pretty harsh diminishing returns when it comes to spending more and more money on a graphics card for Premiere and After Effects. There is, in many projects, not gonna be any difference whatsoever between a $300 2060 and a $700 2080. There are some fringe cases where you're adding tons and tons and tons of GPU accelerated effects, or maybe you're using GPU accelerated plugins where you can hash out maybe like a 20% difference in performance, but that's really not most people's use case. One thing worth mentioning is that because NVIDIA and Adobe have worked closely together over the years to add a number of optimizations into their programs, NVIDIA cards tend to perform a little bit better than AMD cards do at any given price point. So that's why we generally recommend that people get an NVIDIA card at whatever their budget allows. Both AMD and NVIDIA are on the cusp of, or in the process of, launching a new exciting line of graphics cards. Now, you might get really excited about this as someone who is an editor or an animator, but it's probably gonna be more of the same when it comes to increasing performance here. So if you're building a new system from the ground up, then yeah, for by all means, go ahead and get whatever is new at that time. But my point is just that if you have a perfectly functional and serviceable card from this or the previous generation, then you really aren't gonna get very much from upgrading to something brand new. The CPU, the processor, really is the main deciding factor of performance in programs like this. So anyways, I hope all of this information was helpful. If you have any other questions of your own, then feel free to leave those in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and all of that stuff. We're gonna continue to try and put out more videos like this as the PC landscape evolves and as new parts come out, so stay tuned for that.